So this first topic uh, I call the history of Eurovision. And I'm going to start out right off the bat by making a very arbitrary distinction that I draw between Druidism and a word you might actually see more commonly, Druidry. Um, and I've only just started recently to kind of make that distinction up front because people raise that question. Why don't you say Druidry? Why do you say Druidism? Druidry, as I tend to use it, is a word that refers to some revival traditions of Celtic spirituality and bardic poetry and fraternal practice, fraternal lodge practice, that goes under the name of um, Druidry, that refers to the, where the practitioners and members refer to themselves as Druid, um, but isn't necessarily a, a pagan religious tradition or a pagan spiritual tradition. It can be. Um, Druidry tends to be a word used more in Britain. It, as I say, tends to, as often as not, refer to some of the fraternal lodge traditions of, of uh, Druidry, which is akin to Freemasonry. Um, they're more ecumenical, non-religious, spiritual, philosophical. Um, but it does include and is used by a lot of, particularly, again, British solitary practitioners of kind of eclectic, nature-focused pagan spirituality. Um, I've had an opportunity over the last year to participate on a, a primarily British Druid bulletin board on the web, and um, I've gotten a better sense of who the individuals are in the UK, particularly, who identify as Druid. And it is a little different in general from the population who would identify as Druidic in North America. Um, and I think it's partly that there's a maybe more group orientation in the U.S. Um, I'm not so sure about Canada. Um, and a lot of sort of solitary nature, sort of solitary nature worshippers who identify as Druid in the U.K. So when I say Druidism, I'm, as opposed to Druidry, I'm going to be talking more about what I consider to be um, anything linked to or attempting to revive or reconsider or critique the ancient pre-Christian religious systems, the religious ideologies, the religious practices of the Celtic peoples. And I'll, I'll talk about who the Celts were um, somewhat this week and actually probably even more next week. Um, but that's Druidism as I'm using the term. It's, it's a religious system. And it's, it's an ancient religious system. And we know a lot about certain elements of it, virtually nothing about other elements of it. And the challenge is, at least as I see it, and the, the project I've sort of been participating in in my life over the last more than a decade, is to see how much of what has virtually been lost from the past can be um, incorporated into contemporary living. Um, I think whether one makes of Druidism a personal spiritual path, a personal religious practice or not, the exercise of examining it, the exercise of standing it up in contrast to the more common monotheistic religions um, that we encounter in our daily lives these days is useful, it's educational, if nothing else. Um, it can reinforce um, assumptions that you may already be making. It can challenge those assumptions, but I think it's sort of worth any time you can to, um, to look at competing or contrasting systems. And Druidism, because it predates Christianity, is a pretty good, um, is a pretty good uh, example of just that sort of contrasting system. So this evening, uh, we're going to be looking at what we think we know about what that ancient religious ideology, um, ancient religion, pre-Christian religion that I'm calling Druidism, what we think we know about it, what some of the sources are for that. Uh, so I'm going to first be going through uh, sort of the evidence for the work of the ancient Druids. Primarily literary, if you will, and historical, some of it mythological. Um, I'll take a brief look at the archaeology, particularly at ways in which what we get from the archaeology uh, supports what the historical and mythological references suggest. Um, and then out of that, I'm going to sort of examine a little bit more closely who we think 
the Druids were as a class of practitioners in ancient times. They filled a number of roles, and I'll sort of sketch out what those uh, what those roles were. So we'll start by looking at the ancient references to the Druids. When people were referring to Druids in ancient times, they were talking about people who were uh, important personages in tribes, if you will, that spoke uh, a Celtic language. Um, there are a number of Celtic languages still alive today, alive and kicking today, um, probably most prominent among them the Irish language, the Gaelic language of Ireland, um, the Welsh language, the Breton language, Scots Gaelic, and a couple of other minor languages. These are all part of one family of languages. In ancient times there were a few others which have died out since then. Some of them died out quite a number of centuries ago. Uh, one of the most prominent would have been Gaulish, which would be the Celtic language that was spoken in predominantly what is now France, but also the northern part of uh, Italy, the Po Valley, and so on, uh, kind of northwestern Italy. Um, those were ultimately parts of the Roman Empire. They were part of uh, multiple provinces that went by the name of, of Gaul. Um, so there are a number of areas in Europe where Celtic languages were spoken, and within those areas and among the people speaking those languages, there were these personages, as I say, called Druid. <clears throat> Druid appears to be a Celtic word. It's not um, a Greek or Roman word that um, those Mediterranean writers, who I'm going to talk about more in a second, uh, might have applied to the, these uh, people in the Celtic lands. It was a title that the Celts themselves used to talk about these important people who helped their society function. The meaning of the word Druid is obscure. Um, the origin of it is even more obscure. Um, it was thought for a long time that it had to do with the oak tree, um, that perhaps it meant something like an oak seer, that somebody who was a seer or a visionary who had knowledge of the trees. That was kind of a romantic etymology that, that has sort of persisted to this day. A lot of people still assume that's what the word means. It may not really mean that. It may have something to do a little bit more straightforwardly with just with knowledge. Um, it's, it would be false to say at this point that, in the academic world at least, that the notion that the word, that a word referring uh, to oak tree or tree in general is still regarded as part of the origins of the word druid. Um, it's not that it's been ruled out, but that, that theory is less in vogue. Um, and where you see it, you'll find it mostly in rather older books or in websites that are you know, maybe not quite so informed as to current thinking. Uh, but in any case, the word does have something to do with knowledge, um, and that's probably important to hang on to. Um, that these people who were called druids were the intelligentsia, if you will, of their, um, of their era and of their cultures. One of the things, unfortunately, that we do know about these people, these druids, is that they didn't write things down. And in fact, they seem to have had a prohibition against writing things down. Um, that's relatively sort of a famous attribute of, of the ancient Druids. Um, they didn't commit their sacred things to writing. We'll come back to the reasons why, I think, in a moment here. But the important thing is, the lucky thing for us is, that they had neighbors, the Celts had neighbors, who did write things down, sometimes at great length. Um, both the Greeks and the Romans, during a period from, say, the third century before the current era through to, I don't know, about the third or fourth century, I can't remember exactly, of the, uh, of the current era, wrote down various things that made reference to Druids, or in some cases just to the religious practices of the Celtic peoples. The most famous reference is in Julius Caesar's memoir of his campaigns in Gaul, um, De Bello Gallica, uh, of the, Bell, of the Gaul, Gaulish Wars, Gallic Wars, if you will. I'm going to read probably most of it, of his account, uh, because he says a lot, and he says a lot of things about the Druids which are highly relevant 
some of them are supported by other writers. Some of them, whether they're supported by other writers or not, we have good reason to think um, there's some accuracy to them. There's good reasons to question Caesar, and I'll get to why that is uh, after I read some of this. So this is from Caesar, uh, later the emperor, then uh, a general, writing about the Druids in the context of his memoir of his time spent campaigning in Gaul. The Druids preside over sacred things, have the charge of public and private sacrifices, and explain their religion. To them, a great number of youths have recourse for the sake of acquiring instruction, and they are in great honor among them. For they generally settle all their disputes, both public and private, and if there is any transgression perpetrated, any murder committed, or any dispute about inheritance or boundaries, they decide in respect of them. They appoint rewards and penalties. And if any private or public person abides not by their decree, they restrain him from the sacrifices. This with them is the most severe punishment. Whoever are so interdicted are ranked in the number of the impious and wicked. All forsake them and shun their company and conversation, lest they should suffer disadvantage from contagion with them. Nor is any legal right rendered to them when they sue it, nor any honor conferred upon them. Those are the people who have been shunned, right? Forbidden to attend the sacrifices. But one presides over all these druids, who possesses the supreme authority among them. At his death, if any of the others excels in dignity, the same succeeds him. But if several have equal pretensions, the president is elected by vote of the Druids. Sometimes even they contend about the supreme dignity by force of arms. At a certain time of the year, they assemble in session on a consecrated spot in the confines of the Carnutes, which is considered the central region of the whole of Gaul. And that, by the way, is thought to be at um, Chartres in France. Um... To this place, all who have any disputes come together from every side and acquiesce in their judgments and decisions. The institution of Druids is thought to have originated in Britain and to have been thence introduced into Gaul, so from the British Isles brought onto the continent to what's now France. And even now, those who wish to become more accurately acquainted with it generally repair thither for the sake of learning it. I'm going to skip just a little bit here um, start reading about their training. Um, they resort to schools where they are said to learn thoroughly a great number of verses. On that account, some continue at their education for 20 years, nor do they deem it lawful to commit those things to writing, though generally in other cases and in their public and private accounts they use Greek letters. They appear to me to have established this custom for two reasons, because they would not have their tenets published, and because they would not have those who learn them by trusting to letters neglect the exercise of memory. In particular, they wish to inculcate this idea that souls do not die but pass after death from one body to another, and they think that by this means men are very much instigated to the exercise of bravery, the fear of death being despised. They also dispute largely concerning the stars and their motions, the magnitude of the world and the earth, the nature of things, the force and power of the immortal gods, and instruct the youth in their principles. The whole nation of the Gauls is very much given to religious observances. Um, there's some discussion of human sacrifice here, which I'll come back to, but I'm not going to read the whole description. They chiefly worship the god Mercury, of him they have many images. Him they consider as the inventor of all arts, as the guide of ways and journeys, and possessing the greatest power for obtaining money and merchandise. After him they worship Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva. Concerning them they have almost the same opinion of other nations, namely that Apollo awards off diseases, that Minerva instructs them in the principles of works and arts, that Jupiter holds the empire of heaven, and that Mars rules wars. <coughs> Uh, the Gauls declare that they have all sprung from their father, Pluto. You'll usually actually see this translated as dis pater, two words, D-I-S, and then the word for father, P-A-T-E-R. Uh, and this, they say, was delivered to them, this doctrine, was delivered to them by the Druids. That's about 80% of what Caesar wrote. I left out a couple of descriptive passages. Now, 
I suggested that there are reasons to doubt Caesar. Let's cover that point before I go back and talk about why we should probably put some faith and trust in what Caesar said in many respects. Um, the first charge that's usually leveled against Caesar, and the, against this uh, passage in his memoir, is that he's writing propaganda. That the purpose of his memoir, of his exploits as a general, was self-aggrandizement, right? He was making himself out to be um, a successful campaigner, a military, a military genius. Uh, he was drumming up support for his military, his, his work as a general, for his military uh, endeavors. And one thing that we, that human beings do generally, is demonize the adversary. That if you want your troops to go out and uh, kill effectively and without remorse. Uh, the more you can dehumanize and demonize your adversary, the more effective you're likely to be. That's um, not an original thought to me by any means. Um, you can find it in probably any anthropology book that deals with warfare. Um, so it's, it's suggested along those lines that Caesar was doing precisely that, that he was painting a picture of these people that was a picture of a people very different from Roman culture, from the more civilized, urban, and maybe not to say urbane, uh, Roman culture, that these were barbaric people, um, that their religious practices were somewhat different, um, the notion that they indulged in human sacrifice is often seized upon, because by this point in their history, Roman, Rome had outlawed human sacrifice, per se, um, so in a sense, you're suggesting that these are not necessarily that they're bloodthirsty people, but that they're backward, right? Romans probably understood that they had blood on their hands in their own religious past. And that's not often said in this context. Um, but even if that's true, the charge could still be leveled that the Celts, that the Gauls, were backwards. Um, and that, again, is something that we've seen well into contemporary times. Um, anthropologists assuming that Western culture is the pinnacle of the evolution of human societies and that other societies in the third world were not merely different but primitive, that they hadn't advanced. It's possible Caesar is doing something along those lines here and talking about um, the Druids and the peoples um, that they serve. In addition to the charge of propagandizing that's leveled against Caesar, the other and maybe more relevant in my mind criticism is that he was maybe not speaking at first hand. Um, there are really only a small number of passages in uh, writings by contemporaries, people writing at this time in history, uh, that actually talk about the Druids. And it's pretty clear as we look at them that a number of them are quoting from a common source document that we don't have. Um, we know that there is a text, sort of a, uh, a travelogue, if you will, by a fellow by the name of Posidonius. Um, he was from the Eastern Mediterranean. He was a Greek speaker, but he was very enamored of Rome. Um, if you're in any sense familiar with the, the philosophy of Stoicism, um, which was embraced by a lot of prominent Romans, including the famous emperor Marcus Aurelius, uh, who wrote probably the best-known um, Stoic text. Um, Posidonius was Stoic. He appears to have really admired the degree to which the Roman Empire and its culture, uh, or the Roman Republic before that, embodied the philosophies of Stoicism. So he was a Roman, a fan of Rome, uh, an exponent of Roman culture. And so some of the implied criticism of the Gauls and the Druids that may be showing up in some of these classical texts that refer to them, that provide what little evidence we have um, from contemporaries, is not actually first-hand testimony by the writers, but those writers um, either quoting or even plagiarizing Posidonius. And so therefore picking up Posidonius's bias, which was heavily pro-Roman culture, not necessarily so much anti-Druid or anti-Celt, but pro-Roman. So there are these two you know, fairly significant criticisms that can be well with Caesar. And um, some people will go so far as to say, look, you just can't trust anything he says about the Druids. I don't go that far. In fact, 
quite the opposite. I think Caesar is an excellent, um, an excellent resource for providing a springboard uh, from which to launch into an exploration of Druidism. Um, he makes a number of points, and if you sort of pull bullet points out of Caesar's comments, um, you'd find that they line up with a lot of things that we can glean from other resources, from other pieces of evidence uh, from later eras, and even in some cases from archaeology. So I want to sort of pick through Caesar's comments for a few minutes here and sort of pull out those bullet points, because uh, we'll come back to them pretty much throughout this course. Uh, when I get into later discussions of the bardic traditions, um, the notion of memorizing verses is going to be very, very prominent in that. When I talk about the traditional law codes uh, that have survived down through the Middle Ages and that we have in writing from the Celtic nations, um, that's going to resonate very strongly with all of this verbiage from Caesar about settling disputes and arbitrating and passing judgment and, and um, uh, assessing penalties and so on. Um, when I uh, talk about sort of cycle of the year and the, the seasonal festivals, um, major public observances in the last lecture in the series, um, that's going to be extending, amplifying, Caesar's comments about the Druids presiding over these public uh, uh, public sacrifices, the very first thing he says. So this is, in some ways, uh, Caesar's comments, it seems to me, actually do summarize pretty effectively a lot of what we think we know about the work of the ancient Druid. So again, just to sort of pull out some of these bullet points. First thing he says is that they have charge of the public and private sacrifices. Now, I'm not sure about the use of the word private there. It might actually probably be smart for me to sit this, sit this translation next to another one see if the same phrase is there. But it's pretty clear from everything that's said here that the Druids were involved in public religious ceremony. When we say sacrifice, um, sometimes for us moderns, the word has taken on kind of an a overly negative uh, connotation. We think of sacrifice as giving something up, of losing something, of, um, you know, sort of, in a certain sense, throwing something away. But sacrifice, as a word, comes from two pieces in, in Latin that mean to make sacred, to render something sacred. And quite literally, when one makes a sacrifice in a religious uh, context, one is setting it out of human use. That's what the idea of making something sacred is. You make it, in a certain sense, beyond human touch, beyond human usage. You're passing it over into the use of the divine, whatever that is. The many gods and goddesses, a local spirit, um, you know, the one god, the great goddess, whatever it is, whatever the ideology of the, the particular religion is. Making something sacred, sacrificing it, is to take it out of human use, at least in theory, and to give it over to the use of the divine. That's one of the core pieces of Druidism, in my opinion, is that it is a sacrificial, an offertory, if you will, it's a little bit less loaded word, um, religion. That it is organized more than anything else around the notion of human beings giving gifts to the powers in their cosmos that they revere and that they feel um, are their allies or that they want to be their allies. And the Druids, says Caesar, and others suggest as well, were instrumental, had charge over the public sacrifices. He then talks about youths, um, about young people coming to the Druids for instruction. We'll come back to that point. But then he launches into a very lengthy discussion of the Druids settling disputes about things like crime. He mentions murder specifically. But also what we would consider to be civil matters, right? Inheritance and boundaries. They appoint rewards and penalties. This, and we'll, I'll return to this in great length when we talk about the law codes, uh, and I think it's the fourth uh, class in the series, this is a really key point. And just to summarize that future topic, 
what we know of the traditional law codes in the Celtic lands, places like Ireland and Wales, is that they were organized much more like our contemporary civil law system rather than our criminal law system. That they were largely set up, organized around the notion of making restitution for wrongs rather than a government, some sort of third party um, punishing somebody for what they did wrong. Now, this is one of those places where we have to look at what Caesar says carefully and wonder whether he isn't, um, because he's perhaps not speaking at first hand, um, whether he's maybe getting things wrong or confusing things. Because the things he says about rewards and penalties fit very, very well with other evidence we have. When you talk about um, all the punishment uh, that, he's, that he suggests that the droids could inflict, we have less evidence for that, but we do have some. This notion of banishment, that fits in well with our, our sense of traditional Celtic cultures and how they function. Um, and not just because we see that as a, a possible punishment in later eras, but because that was seen as a, a, absenting oneself from society was seen as a form of martyrdom. Um, I don't know if any of you have much knowledge about um, the missionaries from Ireland in the early Middle Ages, but one of their one of the phrases that's applied to their work is um, the white martyrdom. That was one form of martyrdom, and what it was was removing yourself, going on um, pilgrimage, going off, leaving your homeland, and setting up a monastery, establishing a mission somewhere else. Uh, and these Irish missionaries got as far away as northern Italy, maybe further than that, but definitely um, northern Italy. And that was seen, as I say, as a form of martyrdom, in other words, of self-sacrifice. So there is a sense that that was an extreme penalty uh, to remove someone from the society. And as we'll see if you guys attend future talks, um, Celtic society, traditional Celtic society, was highly communal, more so than um, some of the other uh, older cultures of Europe very much organized around kinship relationships. It was a very um, tightly knit web of relationships, of uh, forming relationships by fostering children between families. Everything was about the interconnectedness of the kin group, the larger tribe, if you will, the clan. Um, and so it, it stands to reason in that context that banishing someone uh, was a, you know, a, a severe sanction. There's a notion here that there was some sort of high druid. That's much disputed. Um, we don't have any other real good evidence that would suggest that there was such a person, uh, the equivalent of what some of the more modern druid orders would call an arch druid. Um, in fact, that's where that term sort of got started, is from this notion that there was in ancient times a, a high druid who presided over all the other druids. But what is interesting is Caesar's comment that Upon the death of that person, the president, we would probably say chief, uh, is elected. And that also fits with what we know about ancient Celtic culture. Um, that kings, chiefs, chieftains is probably a better word, um, were selected by merit, not by lineage. Right? that their cultures, for the most part, and these things vary from century to century, as these things will, and from place to place, but in the main, in ancient Celtic culture, leadership was, uh, was a function of, of um, qualification and effectiveness, and not who your father or mother was. It was not by blood, it wasn't by right of descent. This is not to say that there weren't families in which say, you know, Dru there was a lineage of Druids. There were. We have reasonably good evidence for that. Um, and it's absolutely not to say that the ancient Celtic cultures, like other Indo-European cultures, which I'll talk more about next week, uh, weren't organized into castes in the way Hindu uh, society in India is. They were. There was a stratification to the society. And so Druids probably would have come from 
uh, one or maybe two of the, the gas most of the time. But we do have reason to think that that wasn't universally true, that somebody could come from one of the lower classes of society and, and by merit rise to become um, at least an elevated poet, if not perhaps fully a druid. Um, so here, uh, one of Caesar's bullet points, the notion of electing a leader rather than there being you know, a successor by blood fits with what we know about ancient Celtic culture. Druids usually abstain from war, says Caesar. That may or may not be true. The mythology suggests that the Druids participate, although the mythologies, which I'll come back to a little bit um, later on, the mythology suggests that the Druids use their druidical techniques to participate in warfare. They use magical techniques. Um, they aren't necessarily depicted as out there wielding a sword on the front lines in the battles in some of the Irish myths. Um, and to pick up on that and extend that, this notion that the Druids are outside of the conduct of war fits with that caste system, that stratified society that I just suggested. Because one of the distinctions that you find in a lot of European cultures and in ancient pagan Indian, South Indian, Asian Indian culture, which is related, one of the distinctions you find is between the priestly class of, of the nobility, if you will, and the warrior class. That they operate in a certain kind of almost check and balance within the society, within the culture. So it makes sense what Caesar says here, that in some way, on some level, the Druids were not to be dragged into the, uh, the work of the warrior. That there needed to be a distinction within the culture between those two functions. And we do find that in other related cultures. Now here's the really interesting stuff, is where Caesar talks about training. They are said to learn thoroughly a great number of verses. On that account, some continue at their education for 20 years. And then he goes on to, to add the bit about not committing uh, these things to writing, that they do not want um, the ability of the student to use their memory, to develop the capacity to memorize, to suffer through reliance on writing. That fits with virtually everything we know about the elements of Druidism that actually did survive into the Christian era after Christianity removed a lot of the religious practice, the sacrifices to the gods and goddesses, took out all the explicitly religious stuff. A lot of the cultural elements that remain had to do with the practice of poetry, the memorization of poetry, the training of sacred poets, of the training of poets who were responsible for um, protecting and extending the genealogy, the memory of the, the culture of reciting um, the lineage of a chieftain or some other noble. And this extends all the way down into the 18th century at least, so into very recent times. Um, that at least last vestige of what was once Druidism survives into remarkably recent times. And the training that we have glimpses of, and I'll talk more about this in a couple weeks, in some of the memoirs, some of which I've been told are disputed as their accuracy, from as late as I think the 18th century, certainly the 17th century, paint a picture of poets in training who trained for at least 12 years. We have descriptions of the number of verses and alphabets and legal decisions that they're meant to have learned in each year. And there are literally thousands of them. They, in each year, these bards in training, these poets in training, would have to acquire hundreds, if not ultimately thousands of verses through sheer rote memorization. And that their training in composition did not involve writing things down. And this, again, this is down into well into the historic era. It involved people going into seclusion, going into uh, what some people consider to be a form of sensory deprivation, and this is a word that will come up in future lectures as well, incubating verses within themselves and then sort of coming out of seclusion and being able to then perform them, um, to recite them. So, so much of this work involved the development of the, the person into a repository for the culture, if that makes sense. That the Druid was ultimately, if you were going to boil this down into one description, 
the Druid was a living holder for all of the culture. That if Caesar's right and a Druid trained for 20 years, the notion is that at the end of that 20 years, they had taken into their own memory, literally into their own body, if you will, the poetry, the philosophy, the theology, the legal decisions, and so forth. So that at the end of that training, when they were acknowledged as a druid, so-called, um, they literally were a walking compendium of all that was most important in the traditional culture in which they lived. A couple other points. The whole nation of the Gauls is very much given to religious observances, says Caesar. Um, and then he goes on to talk about sacrifice by fire. I didn't read all the, the details because it's a combination of both talking about the manner of sacrifice and also the fact that humans were sacrificed. We do think that there probably was human sacrifice among the ancient Celts. Uh, that's not universally accepted. You'll still get people who really argue about that. Personally, I'm pretty much 100% convinced that there was human sacrifice. There's just too many pieces that fit together, including Caesar's um, comment. But the manner of description, the sacrifice by burning that Caesar described, we don't really have much evidence for. Um, we do have some evidence for other versions. Um, but another important bullet point here is the notion that these sacrifices, these public observances, these re religious observances, are being directed to the gods, plural. So this is, I suppose, next to the notion of many decades or as many years of training and the use of memorization, the other single most important bullet point is that the Druids and the Celtic peoples of old were polytheists, that they worshiped many gods and goddesses, not just one god or one goddess. We don't have any evidence, there's really nothing that would suggest from the archeology, span from the mythology, from what Caesar and others say, we really at this point in time have nothing that would suggest that the Druids or the cultures of which they were a part were in any sense monotheistic. They, they were probably closer to what you might describe as animist, that they saw their universe, their cosmos, as inhabited by many powers that, with which they could deal, with which they could treat, to whom they could offer sacrifice, whose aid they could enlist. Um, it's probably true that each sort of local kin group or tribe or in Gaul, could sort of think of them as nations because they were very large extended groups, um, had local deities who were associated with them. Um, the word that usually used is tutelary deities. And these would be a god or goddess or both who were particularly associated with a given um, clan or tribe or nation. Um, springs, water sources, generally associated with a goddess. There was seen as uh, being a spirit, presumably a goddess, in that place, in that water source. And offerings were typically made at those places. Some of the great sources for uh, some of the great sort of early Celtic art, uh, in metalwork particularly, are recovered from places that were clearly sacred sites where these objects were being placed into the water as offering to the goddess, presumably goddess, in the water. Um, and we'll come back to this probably more than once during the course of the series, but it's important to understand that any transitional or boundary place, really the word is liminal place, um, is an appropriate place for these sorts of sacrifices. And the Celts, most scholars, and I think most modern pagans who delved into this would agree, um, attached a great deal of importance to these liminal, to these boundary places. And a spring is such a place, right? Solid ground, and yet up out of the solid ground comes life-giving fresh water. Um, that's a, an important transition place. It's a, almost a sort of a magic, you know, pre-geology. Um, you know, how do you know where that water comes from? Uh, and even if you do have knowledge of geology, and you can, you know, intuit, you know, it's an aquifer down there, and have some sense of how the aquifer is emerging at the surface there. You know what? It's still pretty special and still pretty precious. And if you're, uh, if you need fresh water, you know, you, you want to do everything you can to, to protect the quality, um, the cleanliness, the purity of that water. Um, 
and in ancient times, one way to do that would be to to offer uh, to the spirit or even the goddess of the place to to protect it to keep it flowing. Um, seashores are probably important places for this sort of thing. Certainly, lake shores. Um, we have examples of sort of bridges that have been built out over bodies of water, and uh, from those structures, then uh, offerings of uh, valuable objects have been placed into the water, and it's clear that those were constructed for ritual purpose. Uh, hilltops, natural hilltops, or even artificial hilltops, um, great mounds. Um, that's a transition between earth and sky. Uh, it's taken as probably a given that the ancient Celts saw, along with other Indo-European peoples, and I'll, I'll probably get back into this next week, um, but in case I don't, I'll say it now, divided the world more or less into three realms, kind of a middle where we are, and then an above and a below. And depending on where you are, you know, ancient pre-Hindu India, or Rome, or the Celtic lands of Western Europe, what those realms were exactly might vary a little bit. Um, but the general notion is that the Celts, the ancient Celts, saw the world as divided into land, sea, and sky. And you could think of it as this, you know, the sky being the vault above, where all the fiery things are, all the, the things that give us light. And that the sea is not just necessarily the ocean, it's not just the water, but it's, it's that sort of bowl of water that supports and lays, lies under all of the uh, land that we live on that it's a kind of a primal ocean out of which the cosmos that we inhabit rises, um, that it's the great unformed um, void in a certain sense, that it's a realm of chaos, which, you know, the ocean is. You know, if, you, if you're out there on uh, wooden boats with no motor, it's uh, it would be a rather intimidating place to be. And then the land is the place where we are, where the many creatures are, where um, the animals as well as the plants um, and we live. And it's that intersection between land and sea. And so these boundary places, hilltops, the boundary between land and sky, um, lake shores, the boundary between land and sea, um, the spring, the water source where the sea seems to bubble up from the very rock. Um, these are important and sacred places. Caesar mentions a few gods uh, that he says the Celts worship. And he gives Roman names, at least in this translation he gives Roman names. Chiefly, he says they worship the god Mercury. Um, and he specifically says they consider him the inventor of all arts. Now, a lot of scholars think that this list of uh, Roman deities is probably a reasonably accurate one if you take it uh, in the proper context. The Romans were very fond of doing uh, what they call the Interpretatio Romana, uh, which is to put Roman, familiar Roman names onto foreign deities and practices. And it just happens that we have evidence for a Celtic god, Lu or Lugus, uh, who in the Irish myths at least, was known as Saldana, the master of all arts. So here we go. Caesar's pointing out a god who he identifies as Mercury, but he specifically says that he was important to the Celts because he was seen as the inventor of all arts. So pretty good indication that the god Lu is the god that Caesar was identifying with the Roman god Mercury. And it's interesting that he identifies him as preeminent because we probably have the most references to Lu, Lu, Lugus, versions of the same name from the, uh, the widest expanse of um, Celtic-speaking lands of any of the deities for whom we have names. In other words, Lu, or versions of that name, uh, is found more often and more widely than any other gods and goddesses for whom we have evidence. You know, and in a nutshell, that's a good this is a good example of why I think it's it's sort of foolish to throw Caesar's testimony out as biased. Uh, I think that's happening less than I saw even like 10 years ago, but I still see people kicking at it. And one reason I think they kick at it is because of all this, of this description of human sacrifice. Um, and for people who want to 
try to find contemporary value in Druid ideology, Druid religion, ancient Celtic religion, even if you don't want to use the word Druid to associate with it. Um, you know, it's a little uncomfortable to see them, to see your role models as people who are slaughtering humans for a religious purpose. And at the end of the day, you know, my attitude is we're not them, and we're not going to do, and certainly we should not do everything they did. Um, and not just things, you know, things that are morally abhorrent to us moderns, like human sacrifice. You know, banishing people from sacrifice. I mean, what would uh, banishing people from attending religious ritual. What would be the conditions that would make us do something like that? If we were holding such rituals, would they be the same reasons as the ancients did? Probably not. Uh, we might even do it for more trivial reasons. We might do it because they got drunk uh, through a punch. You know, wouldn't have to be for the the worst, most horrible offenses of all. Bottom line is, we're not the same people. We don't have the same worldview. We have. You know, different intellectual tradition, different ethical tradition. So we take what we can, what's relevant, learn from what seems to resonate with who we are as people, use what feels interesting and helpful to broaden our own perspectives. Um, but we don't have to, you know, just because we want to be guided by some of this uh, ancient practice and some of these ancient customs and traditions. Um, you know, we don't have to be put off by the fact that they probably did do things like human sacrifice. And that Caesar may be right about that, and it doesn't mean we should throw out and find reasons to disregard the other things that Caesar said that are probably true. Um, and the last point Caesar made, um, that the Celts declare that they have sprung, which I missed one, i got to go back, but that the Celts declare that they've sprung from their father, who in this translation is identified as Pluto, the lord of the underworld. Um, you'll also see, as I said, Dis Potter, the father of Dis, the infernal region. Um, there is a notion that there is a lord of the halls of the dead uh, who was the first human to die that we find not only in Celtic mythology, particularly specifically Irish mythology, but we also find as far away as in the Indo-European traditions of India. Um, in pre-Hindu and early Hindu mythology, Yama, the Lord of the Dead, is also the first mortal to die and pass on into the other world, into the realms of the dead, and so it becomes uh, sort of the god that you offer to for safe passage of the newly deceased into the realms of the dead. The Irish, in their mythology, have a similar figure called Don, D-O-N-N, uh, who was the first mortal to die in the land of Ireland and became the lord of, of sort of the god of the dead, the hall of the dead. Um, and so there's that notion of the first human being to pass away in the land um, and then everyone else follows. Um, there's a, these are sort of a lineage in a certain sense that, again, is kind of roughly coherent with what Caesar's suggesting here. Um, there have been a lot of attempts to try to identify who that god was, if there's a name for that god. Um, some have suggested an Irish name, Bila, B-I-L-E, as being the first father, the primordial father. There's arguments about that. I'm not sure I believe that. Um, but it's certainly... Uh, is, it makes absolute sense that for Caesar to say that the Celts had a religious ideology, a sort of myth structure that identified sort of a first ancestor. And it stands to reason that that first ancestor is also the first to pass into the other worlds and that the rest of the people will follow along that path down through the generations. The point that I missed that, that's important that I sort of backtrack on is um, Caesar is not alone in saying that the Druids supposedly taught um, the notion of not just reincarnation, but um, what more specifically would be called the transmigration of souls, the movement of a soul from one body into another. He says that after death, the Druids teach that the souls move into another, and therefore the Celtic peoples, the Gauls, will have no fear of death, and therefore they're uh, fierce fighters in war. Um, Other writers of the time, at least one other, I shouldn't say others, because I'm not sure there was more than one other, 
suggested the same thing and compared the teachings of the Druids to the teachings of the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who is quite famous for advancing the idea of the transmigration of souls, that souls move from one body to another after death. The mythology and particularly the archaeological remains, the burial practices of the ancient Celts, don't really suggest this so much. They do suggest a belief in an afterlife. That's clear, that after you depart from this world, you move into another existence, in another realm, and that, particularly for important people, for chieftains and such, it's probably important to send along some of your belongings so that you're well equipped um, to flourish, to continue to be an important person in the next world. Um, but there's only really, to my knowledge, only one instance, at least one that I can recall reading, where there's a notion that some famous hero from earlier myth is reincarnated in the person of so-and-so. And it's actually, I think, King Mongan in one of the myths is supposed to be a reincarnation of the earlier Celtic hero, Finn the Cool. Um, and the fact that that's so exceptional, that that doesn't really come up, uh, and that the burial practices suggest sending along things that are that were belong to you in this existence would seem to actually contradict the idea that you're going to move into some other life. You know, why would you send along? I mean, you could end up being a you know a young woman. Why would you send along you know the battle gear for some six foot four you know berserker warrior um, if you're just going to move into another existence? No, it's far more likely that the notion was that after you left this life, your life continued on and maybe some more elevated and more interesting and maybe longer lasting um, other world existence. And so you needed your stuff. That's a bit of a generalization. And if funeral practices in these places in Europe that we're considering here change from century to century and from place to place. So it's not always the case that at every place and you know, lands that we consider to be part of the Celtic world, that people were being sent into the other worlds with their belongings. Uh, but that frequently the case. And certainly the mythology suggests that there were other places where feasting and other activities went on elsewhere. And more importantly, in other cultures that spoke Indo-European languages, languages related to the Celtic languages, and I'll talk more about this next week, um, there were the, those ideologies, those sorts of ideologies, that um, there were places like Valhalla you know, where the heroes went after um, this life to continue drinking and fighting and brawling and doing all the things that warriors do. Caesar has the fullest account of the Druids. Um, there are some other fairly famous Greek and Roman accounts. Maybe the most famous is by um, Pliny. Uh, he's responsible for what is often referred to as the one description of a Druid, of Druid ritual that survives to us. It's the so-called mistletoe ritual, where Druids in white robes harvest mistletoe from an oak with a golden sickle. I think there's a sacrifice. I could find it in your I suppose, and read it. But in, in broad strokes, there's a bull sacrificed uh, in preparation for the harvesting of mistletoe uh, by Druids in white robes with a golden sickle. The sixth day after the new moon. The sixth day, yes, and the sixth day of the moon, uh, which is usually taken to be the sixth day after the dark of the moon. Yeah, that's the most common interpretation of that. Where was it? Oh, the, the golden sickle. Um, you know, it's become kind of a, an emblem or a badge of office for some you know, modern druids or at least you know, latter day druids. Um, and one of the things that people mention to call uh, Pliny's description into the question is that gold is such a soft metal and mistletoe has such a sturdy um, sort of stem on the tree that um, it would be pretty hard to keep the edge on the sickle sufficient to cut it. Um, it's not to say it couldn't be done, but um, I'm far more skeptical of that description, of that account, than of the things in Caesar's description. Um, we have suggestions in some of the Irish mythology that survives to us of druids wearing things like bird feathered cloaks, um, you know, speckled or multicolored apparel rather than white robes. Um, you know, white robes, you know, so we've got this cover of this John Matthews Druid Source book. You can see, you know, contemporary druid at uh, probably the solstice, maybe at Stonehenge, blowing a horn, wearing this white robe. 
Um, that's kind of become the standard apparel for a lot of modern druid orders. Um, and it's based on what I think is probably, you know, kind of faulty um, commentary by one of the ancients. Um, maybe it described what was being worn on one sort of occasion or for one sort of ritual. Maybe not. Maybe it wasn't worn at all. Um, but what's interesting is that is probably not the only uh, druid ritual that survives to us. You'll often hear us are described as such. But apart from these Roman and Greek commentators, there was material in the Irish myths and to a, probably a lesser degree in the Welsh tales that survived to us. And I'll talk about why I say to a lesser degree in a minute. Um, that fleshes out our picture of who the Druids were. Um, we have an example from Ireland of what's likely to be a more accurate description of a Druid ritual. It's still not much of a description. In fact, we have, to, you know, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most people, absolutely no real descriptions of a complete sort of workable Druidic ritual. But the one sort of full-ish description we have is of a divinatory ritual to identify the next king. And it's called the Tara Vesh, um, T-A-R-B-H, F-H-E-I-S, pronounced just like it's spelled, hmm. um, which means roughly bull feats. And it's an occasion where a group of druids, we're told, would rhythmically chant around a druid who was wrapped in the hide of a freshly slaughtered bull, having himself ingested some of the bull's meat, in order to put that druid into a divinatory sleep so that he would then dream the identity of the next king which sort of is shamanic sounding, uh, a word that a lot of Celtic pagans get really hinky around, but I don't have a problem with it, because it talks about a certain kind of consciousness or shift in consciousness, um, moving into a visionary trance or a visionary um, state of one sort or another, and particularly being supported by some sort of rhythmic chanting. Um, that seems like a reasonably good uh, description of an actual druid ritual. Not least because we know cattle were important animals in, in sacrificial contexts. So slaughtering a bull um, and using the hide, ingesting the flesh as a means to stimulate vision, um, fit with other evidence we have. We have a brief description, actually more than one description, of a, of a manner of poetic inspiration called the Invis Frosni, which I'll talk more about when we do the Bardic traditions in a couple weeks, where, again, at least in one version, uh, meat is chewed in order to stimulate vision. And actually, one passage that refers to this uh, technique, the person who is using the technique is trying to, think, is trying to determine the name of some uh, uh, personage that is eluding him. Uh, he wants to find out the name of uh, figure out the identity of this person. Um, and so he uses this technique, the misprosny, um, and it involves chewing. So if you start to connect dots, you know, you look at something like this Taravesh, this brief description, and say, okay, we have other reasons to assume that some of the elements that are being described here uh, would have been appropriate for ancient Celtic divinatory ritual. Sadly, that's, as I say, the fullest description we probably have of what was likely to be an actual Druid ritual. Like thin with stuff. Yeah, it's the same thing. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Sometimes it's it's um, the meat of a, of a bowl. It's, you know, sort of um, it's beef. Sometimes it is literally chewing on a thumb or sucking on a thumb, something like that. Um, there is something about apparently chewing... Um, you know, replacing something in the mouth that stimulates vision or stimulates knowledge, brings knowledge. Uh, and that process that I just sort of laid out of like why why when I say the I would trust the Taravesh as being a more accurate or more likely to be an accurate description of the Druid ritual than the description of the mistletoe ritual, the six night of the moon ritual. Because there are more dots you can connect more uh, pathways you can sort of walk down to find your way to that practice. Uh, it fits into a fuller context, uh, a context that's more fleshed out, no pun intended. 
Uh, and it's that process of trying to ransack through mythology, the meager testimony of the Greeks and the Romans, uh, what pieces we have from archaeology, uh, what pieces we can glean from other cultures, other related cultures, uh, how they might, say, use cattle or horses or other animals and sacrifice. Um, that goes into the process of reconstructing what the Druid religion was like, um, and then from that trying to extract things that might be usable for us today. Um, so let me do a little bit of summary about um, the Druids and their religion. And then next week I'll talk about the notion of reconstructing Druidism, and also I think I'll do some of the history that I, I said I would get to if I had time. I'll do next week on sort of how we get to modern Druidism. Um, so if there is Druidism, if the Druids, as a class of people who we've described at some length, were the priests, if you will, of a Celtic religious system, what could we, what could we say were the uh, sort of the main elements of that religious uh, ideology, that religious tradition? Well, we've mentioned the concept of an afterlife, and that involves veneration of ancestors. Uh, it's important. The status, the ensured well-being of the ancestors is important. I've already alluded to the notion that uh, bards down into the historic era were trained in, in, in uh, genealogies, that they learned uh, to recite the lineage of a chieftain and that sort of thing. That was an important function. So veneration of the ancestors linked to a concept of an afterlife, of, another, of, of an existence in another world after death in this world is a central part of this religion. Sacrificial customs, right? making offering, making things of value, giving gifts of value to the divine entities that you wanted to be your allies. There are a lot of different methods for that. I've mentioned submersion, right? putting things in water. I've mentioned uh, in passing cremation, burning things. And if you think again about those three realms, the land with the sea below and the sky above, if the sky is the realm of the bright, let's call them celestial beings, um, then putting something in the fire to go upwards to them makes sense. Putting something in the water to go down into the, the, uh, the sort of mothering, formative beings below makes sense too. Um, things could be buried. Things could also be hanged on trees. You know, even today you'll still see, you know, prayer cloths, or clutis, I think they call them in some uh, Celtic places tied on the branches of trees for petition. Um, the notion of liminal places, boundary places, as being proper places to do sacred work, that's probably common across the Celtic land. There's certain common deity names. We mentioned Lou. Uh, another one is Bridget or Breed, um, common you know, well known from the Irish traditions, but there's also similar names found in Britain and elsewhere, like Brigantia. It's worth knowing that that name isn't necessarily so much a name as a title. That root, Brig, B R I G, means exalted, heightened, high. So in, if you're referring to Bridget, St. Bridget, Breed, the goddess, Brigantia, the British goddess, what you're really saying is exalted one. Um, and any number of Actually, Celtic god and goddess names are um, uh, ultimately titles, they're descriptions, as much as they are personal names. Brigade have an English or Celtic origin? Word brigade? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the etymology of that, actually. I don't know if that's related or not. It's I know question. the structure goes all the way back to some city. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, and then lastly, the notion of uh, at least some periodic public ceremony that the communities gathered at important occasions and made public offerings. Um, there's also a private component to all of these European and Indian paganisms, but one of the things that's important in what we can call Druidism is that there was also a public communal um, uh, part of the religion 
it was presided over by these specialists, by these trained people who were entrusted with the responsibility of making sure that these occasions were handled properly. Uh, and with that, we'll take a break.